Hello? All right. This is so great. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm from Chicago. This is my first time in Namur, my first time uh, outside of Brussels, and I am so thrilled. I hope you can feel the love, feel the joy in the air. I am always excited to talk about Afrofuturism. Uh, Afrofuturism is a, it's a term that was created uh, just a few decades ago, but in the past decade, uh, the term has really come to become this real synergetic force, uh, aligning a lot of relationships to space and time and alternate realities, possible futures, and relationships to the past, all through the lens of the African diaspora and the uh, African continent and the cultures that are part of those, those continents. And I think what is most exciting to me is that there are so many people who are excited and thrilled to think about these perspectives on space and time and beingness as they come to look at their own lives and craft new futures, uh, re-envision possibility, uh, re-engage with elements of our past, and build in a way that ultimately values humanity. Afrofuturism for me is most exciting because it values humanity, it acknowledges that people of African descent and on the continent have a relationship to space and time, but it also celebrates the role of the imagination in being resilient. The role that the imagination has played in all of our lives to help enrich us, to help us form community, to help us understand the nature of possibilities and to be an, an ultimate connector. And so there were times when people would come together and they would discuss futures and they would discuss what we need to do to create a better world. And the imagination was not always at the forefront. Comic books, music, dance, theater, culture, the role that it played in helping to sustain us and helping to really forge the relationships that we have to our own identity and culture and space weren't always acknowledged in thinking about so-called futures. And specifically, it, it wasn't always acknowledged in thinking about people of African descent and on the continent. Oh, wonderful. So here is Sun Ra, who many of you are familiar with. Sun Ra is a titan in the, the field of Afrofuturism, uh, in part because he helped to shape uh, and give voice to a lot of the philosophy that we now associate with Afrofuturism. I had the pleasure of writing the liner notes for the reissue of Space is the Place. Woohoo! Uh, and when I was listening to the album, it struck me that I had never quite listened to the album before. Now, I'd watched the film. And this image is from the film that was created to be this sort of visual articulation of Sun Ra's vision. Uh, but the, the film itself doesn't quite reflect everything that the album comes to symbolize. And I realized that when listening to it. So again, I listened to certain songs on the album. I watched the film many times. I had discussed the film. I really analyzed the film but I hadn't listened to the entire album. So if you have any takeaway for today, other than valuing the imagination, I would encourage you to listen to the Sun Ra album from beginning to end, listen to Space is the Place. So when you look at the, the title of the album, it says Space is the Place, and you're like, oh, okay, great, Space is the Place. And then you think about it, and you say, hmm, Space is the Place. And initially the thought was, okay, well that's some sort of hip cat jazz terminology of saying space is the place to be. It's the perfect club, it's the, the after work set to go to, it's the, the gathering spot where all the cool kids are. And then you think about that and you're like, all right, great, space is the place. And then the question is, well, space is the place. If it's the place, why aren't you there? And you're like, hmm, well, 
<laughs> well, if space is the place, where is it? And when you turn the album on, the first question, uh, Sun Ra doesn't attempt to really address this where space is. He gives you a further thought to ponder. He says that it's after the end of the world, don't you know that yet? So literally, you're going from this assertion that space is the place, and then this underpinning of, well, if it's the place, why aren't you there? And then the opening line for the entire album is, it's after the end of the world, don't you know that yet? And I would say that this is a space-time relationship that Sun Ra is posing for us. He's telling us about a place that we don't quite feel we could get to, and if we, but we should be there. And then he's telling us that it's after the end of the world. And of course, we did not know it was after the end of the world because we are all standing here present. But in Afrofuturist literature and works and theory, there is an understanding that there were beginnings and endings throughout the cycle of time. For some people, the transatlantic slave trade was an end. For some people, colonialism and forces coming into their nations and countries and being was an end. For some people, the Holocaust was an end. And so there are many moments for many cultures and spaces that was an end of a world, but as we know, it was an end of one thing, but there was another beginning that was inherent in that end. So when he's asking us, hey, he's saying space is the place, don't you know that yet? And, and then saying, oh, it's after the end of the world. Well, we're now in a sense of disorientation. And that sense of disorientation is then enhanced by a flurry of, of brass instruments uh, swirling us into space. And the, the sonic journey that we're on feels as if, ah, I am now on a spaceship and I am moving into space, heading to a destination. And the first few songs feel like you're heading to this dis destination. There's this sense of trying to get your bearings. Oh, where am I? And you're, you're looking at the, the stars and the, the planets ahead and just sort of enjoying everything. It's not much of a bumpy ride. And then comes a, a historical moment where one of the songs uh, is an homage to ancient Egypt. And it, it talks about ancient Egypt in this nostalgic way where it helps to center that a lot of, Af that so much of Egyptian culture was shaped by people who could be described as, as being black today, but certainly Egypt itself being centered in Africa and Sun Ra embodied that. Clearly, he named himself after an Egyptian deity. So he's now giving homage to this other space and time. And you're thinking, okay, well, we're on our way to this destination and we're giving homage to ancient Egypt. You're like, all right, so there's, there's a couple spaces. There's the destination we're moving to and there's this space in the past. Lovely, a glorious time as he tells the story. And so we're moving about, and Sun Ra kind of poses other moments too that make us question this nature of space that he's thinking about. At one point, he's t there's a song where it says, calling planet Earth, calling planet Earth. And it's almost as if everyone is in a classroom and planet Earth is asleep. And there's a, a teacher or, or some administrator at the front saying, calling planet Earth, calling planet Earth and planet Earth is just kind of in slumber and then looks up and says, oh my goodness, I'm being called and tries to gather their books and, and run to the front. All of the, the hurriedness, uh, the, the feeling that Earth isn't quite ready, that it's trying to get its bearings, that it is looking to, to assert itself. And there's a moment throughout the album where Sun Ra says, everything is in its place except you, planet Earth. And then we get another relationship to space. We're saying, all right, we're moving to this future. We are, no, excuse me, we're moving to this destination. There's a past we're giving homage to. And then there's Earth, our home, which 
needs to assert its relationship to humanity in a way where there's, there's more of a holistic uh, embodiment of the ideals of what Earth and its people could be doing. And so we continue on, on this journey, and there's another relationship to space that Sun Ra asserts. He then says, I am the alter destiny. Now, usually when Sun Ra is talking about the alter destiny, he describes it as this idealized space that we as human beings are crafting and creating, uh, one where we can be free as we want to be, one where we can live our dreams and, and be in harmony. And we're thinking, oh, great. The alter destiny is this place to be. That must be the destination we're moving towards. But then Sandra speaks as if this is a state of consciousness to then move into, to evolve into. So you're like, okay, that's another relationship to space. I can understand that one. I have no idea where to point this clicker. I just feel like I should swing in the air. Um, and then there's another point where Sun Ra in the, the story says, well, you're not quite ready. Some of you aren't ready to take the journey and that's okay. So we will build a space for you. And then you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was just in space. We're on this way to this destination. We're giving an homage to a past. You're telling me that this is a space to, that's metaphysical, that I can evolve into, a sense of embodiment and perfection, a sense of humanity that I can grow into. And now you're saying that it's a future space that's yet to be, and that some of us aren't quite ready to be there. And while I can maybe deal with the not quite ready to be there, I'm now recognizing that we are talking about space in multiple ways. And at another point in the album, Sun Ra says, I am a brother to the wind, and that you can't fight the wind. And so then he's asserting that he is also an element. So this relationship to space or relationship to an altered destiny is one where space is both a physical destination, it's the past, it's the future, it's present earth, and it's the element, it's an element, and in Sunrise case, a life-sustaining element. And so this rich, dynamic space that's free to be it's, some, it's multiple spaces. And this uh, core relationship to space and time that Sun Ra is articulating in his work is one that we see reflected in a lot of Afrofuturist works. It's also symbolized in the Akan symbol, Sankofa. And the Sankofa symbol, which you'll see at the the heart of our hero's chest here, is a symbol that loosely means to bring the best of the past into the future. Or saying in order to move forward, you have to look back. And this sort of time space dynamic is one that is at the heart of not just Afrofuturist works, but many African, African diasporic conversations where people are talking about history and futures. And I would challenge you to look at works that are described as Afrofuturist, and you'll probably notice that there are many f facets of time that are embodied in this moment. Afrofuturism is unique because it recognizes that the future, past, and present can very much be one. Uh, and this is described as being nonlinear. Afrofuturism is a way of looking at futures and alternate realities through a black cultural lens, through uh, recognizing the cultures of the diaspora and on the continent. It's an artistic aesthetic. 
It's a method of self-liberation, self-healing. It's epistemology or worldview. It's a practice, a way of being. Uh, and it's one that integrates the imagination, mysticism, technology, and liberation. But it's also a cultural relationship to space and time. And this cultural relationship to space and time is one that we have to, we, one in which we acknowledge that all cultures have a relationship to space and time. And the African, African diasporic relationships, to the extent that they are different, they are always complementary. These relationships to space and time are evident in art and music and dance and, and architecture, ways of being and language. Um, music, if you think about hip hop, uh, the use of the remix, the use of sampling, this quilt work dynamic of pulling elements of music in the past, their sounds in the past, and then taking these tapestries of music to articulate another sound is in one way very Sankofic, and one way sort of embodies this mismatch of, of perceptions that Sun Ra spoke of. I think about the improvisation uh, that's in, in jazz music. And there's a, a fun film to watch called uh, Some Cry of Jazz, where the statement was made that jazz is dead. And of course, jazz is not dead. This film came out in the 50s. But this statement was that so much of the jazz and how it was constructed reflected black American identities of the time meaning that the structure of jazz, of uh, the repeating sequences, reflected the limitations of the society, and the improvisation that was within those frameworks reflected, the, reflected a sense of freedom that people were trying to find in these boundaries. Now, this was a, a, a thought that was shared in the film in the 50s, a film not so ironically, that Sun Ra is featured playing the piano in. One that also came from Chicago, my hometown. Yay, Chicago. Um, but it's a, it's again, it's this idea that this relationship to moving backwards and forward or thinking about time and space and those philosophical relationships uh, being reflected in the tapestry of music, the tapestry of the metaphor or the rhythm of language. Um, I think about the rhythm of the language in hip hop and a lot of the metaphors, a metaphor is used in, in poetry and in diasporic poetry that again, reflects a particular kind of timing, all of which is an outgrowth of a relationship to space and time. And these relationships to space and time are informed by spiritual practices. They're informed by cosmology, philosophy. And I, I should probably just group spiritual practices, philosophy, and cosmology in one. Uh, but it's also informed by actual geography and time of birth. Now, I know some of you think I'm talking about uh, astrology, but not quite. I'm literally talking about the relationship we have to how we experience time based on when we're born. So my relationship to, to time being born in Chicago, um, coming of age in the 80s, is not the same as someone's relationship to, to time if they were born in Australia in year 1200, or the same relationship to time that someone might have um, here in Belgium in year 2085. There are perspectives that change how we experience time and how we think about time. Now this of course isn't to say that time cannot be measured. We measure time with our watches and our clocks and our devices all the time, ha ha ha. However, uh, the measurement of time is not time itself. And our relationship to that is one that is ongoing. <laughs> so mysticism and technology are viewed as flip sides of the same coin uh, in Afrofuturism. 
And, but it's also acknowledged that in Afrofuturism, um, technologies aren't always, uh, they're, they're tools or systems that can help us navigate the world, frame our environments, and the occurrences in our life, and aid us in communicating, but they don't have to be the actual devices that we often associate technology with. So technology, yes, you can talk about our apps, you can talk about the computer, you can talk about this clicker I have in my hand right now, um, but there are other systems which help us to understand who we are, which help us to relate to our environment, which help us to frame our environment that are actually technologies too. And here I'm listing our wisdom systems, um, which again goes into some of our, our African diasporic cosmologies, our continental cosmologies, or just generally speaking. Uh, writing is a technology. It's a way of taking ideas and articulating them through particular symbols. Uh, drumming is a technology, one of communication originally, um, where it's de designed to help alter relationships to space and time, but also to literally send messages. Our intuition can be thought of as a technology. Um, ancestor acknowledgments, which can also be grouped with wisdom systems, are thought of as technologies. And then storytelling could be a technology. Uh, and to that end, race too is a technology. Certainly one we don't always think of in that way. But the categorization systems that we've been placed in, some of which have been enforced through law and violence, et cetera, granted we work very hard to minimize or to erase some of the imbalance in the relationships, uh, but it's that categorizing of human beings is a technology that many of us shape and look at our world through. It's a lens sort of placed upon us, which we kind of group and organize around. Granted, we're eliminating the imbalances. However, it's important to acknowledge that it's a technology because it's also a reminder that it can be dismantled. So technologies aren't always good. They aren't always bad. But they are systems that are informed by philosophical thought, cosmologies, perspectives. And, and when I'm saying this, I'm talking about the technologies that are our digital technologies, our gadgety technologies, in addition to um, technologies like writing or actual wisdom systems. All of these are informed by culture, they're informed by perspective, Sometimes they're informed by histories. So I know sometimes there's this argument that, oh, our technologies are neutral and it's how we use them. No, the design of it is inherently based on some kind of relationship to space and time, some kind of relationship to what's of value or what isn't of value, some sort of relationship to how humanity should be uh, how humanity should be meandering, how humanity should be connecting or not connecting. And these are all things to keep in mind as we both create technologies, but for the purpose of my conversation and many of you here, also something to keep in mind as we use our technologies. I argue that in addition to the many things that uh, we've discussed today with respect to the nature of space, the nature of time, how culture comes to shape that in Afrofuturism, that all of us are also contending with another relationship to, to, to technologies, to space and time, that is really being shaped by the virtual worlds and the spaces that some of our newer technologies are placing us in. I was in uh, Cancun, Mexico several years ago, and I was with my 19-year-old cousin. 
and we were, it was his first time being in Mexico. It was his first time being out of the country. He, like myself, was from the U.S. He was very excited. And he, he got to Mexico and he realized his phone didn't work in the country. And we said, oh, you have nothing to worry about. You know, we're with you. We're all together. All the places you would want to go are on one strip. So you can't get lost. And when I say one strip, meaning that there's several blocks with hotels and places to go and, and, and clubs and restaurants. Uh, and as long as you just stay on that strip, you're fine. So my cousin and I decided that we were going to go out. It was his first time going to a club, so we go up the strip, we go to the club, we dance the night Fandango, and when we're on our way back, he, acknowledging that he doesn't have his phone, says, man, if I wasn't here with you, I would have no idea how to get back. And I said, well, wait a minute, the, it's a straight line. I so said, all we did, we were here, and then we just walked here. That's all we did. He said, no, without my phone, I would have had no way of knowing where we were. And I said, well, look, you know, when you're, whenever you're out, you want to look around. You know, you want to observe the buildings that you're passing. And, you know, there'll be certain markers. Um, maybe there's certain people. Uh, and you can, you know, if you ever get lost, you can ask a question to a person. If you don't want to ask someone on the street, you can ask someone in one of the buildings that you're passing. They're public buildings. They're used to, there's people inside who can answer your question. All of this sound like brand new information to him. And I realized, wow. There's a disconnection that our technologies can provide just with respect to engaging with our environment. So while I love our mapping devices, I used them several times while I was here and I was very grateful, I was very happy, but I learned very quickly that the destinations I was trying to get to were just three or four blocks away. And I'm looking at my device and my device can make me feel very confident, very self-reliant. I am looking at this address and I know where to go and I don't have to talk to anyone and I don't have to ask anyone and I don't have to pay attention. I'm just gonna look at my device and then I'm gonna find it and then here I am. Now, I'm speaking in English. I speak some French. I certainly speak enough French to be able to ask for directions and say basic greetings and so forth. So if I was ever lost, I could always ask questions. But what kind of experience does one have if they go to a new country, they don't engage, they don't use the language, even a little bit just to practice. They're not paying attention to the buildings around them, but they're going from one location to the next and it's all within a square mile. To what extent are we taking ourselves out of the world? Uh, and what sort of senses are we dulling? I have a series of questions to pose with respect to our technologies. And I, these are all just things for us to think about in terms of our identity. Do the algorithms in our tech override our intuition, our observations about the, our environment, our sense of discovery? Just something to think about. And I think these are personal questions because there's a, a space where we all have to think about how we're choosing to engage because we're very much in a, a, a time where there are technologies that we have to use. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing, but the more aware we are around the fact that we are using them, 
and that they could be shaping how we engage in our environment, the more empowered we can be about how we use them, if we use them, when we use them, or what we expect our designers and the creators and those who are shaping our technologies, the, what we expect from them, what kind of relationship we want with them. And it should be a relationship that's mutual and based on conscious choice. Are the technologies I'm using disconnecting me from my environment? Well, clearly, I gave you one of my favorite technologies as an example, GPS, and yes, it can. In one sense, it can be very efficient. In one sense, I can feel very self-reliant, but I'm not relying on myself. I'm not relying on information I was necessarily given from various parties. I'm relying on information, usually factual information, that's coming from a satellite, which is okay but I just need to recognize that. And I need to recognize that if I am not conscious in my busyness, I can miss the world around me. And I can live a life where I'm spending days and days in some altered space and not thinking about the technologies around me. I think some of you think I'm getting a little personal. <laughs> Where am I mentally, emotionally, and physically when I'm engaged with my technologies? So, I'm a dancer. You can see my dancing shoes here. Um, and I've come to recognize that dance can very much be a technology. It's an articulation of space and time. And sometimes when I would do my writing, when I was finished, I would go and do some dancing. And I thought of it as being me shifting from something very mental to doing an, uh, a, an activity that really placed me in my body. But I found that I when I was finished dancing, it was hard for me to go back to writing. And I didn't understand why it was taking me so long to make this shift. And I mentioned it to a friend of mine who's, um, I'll say like a, a counselor, therapist. And he said, well, when you're moving from your writing to your dancing, you're still in creative space. And I said, well, no, no, no. See, I was in a mental activity, and now I'm moving into a physical activity. And he said, okay, well, when you're dancing, where are you? I said, oh, well, you know, usually I'm in my living room, or, you know, sometimes I'm in the basement. He said, no, where are you in your mind when you're dancing? I was like, oh, well, certainly not in this living room, right? You know, I'm in Bahia, dancing at a club I've never been to. I'm salsa dancing with friends I knew several years ago. I'm in any number of spaces, but not in my immediate physical space. He said, okay, you're selling creative space then. And so then you have to do another shift to get out of that one. And, and that was very uh, insightful for me. Because again, I thought I'm getting out of, you know, I'm on the screen, mental writing space, shifting to dancing space, but I'm still in an altered space. So when we're using our technology, some would say, oh, you're in the virtual world, you're in cyberspace, perhaps, but you're also in an altered space, not necessarily relating to your immediate space, and my question is, where are you? Mentally, emotionally, or even imaginatively. Sometimes you can be on the phone call with a friend and it's as if the two of you are on a kitchen table talking together. Sometimes you can be on the phone with a person and you can feel the miles between you. I would just encourage us to think about where we are. What is my relationship to space and time when using my technologies? I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> but I think it's something for us to ponder. How do the technologies I use impact my relationships? During the pandemic, 
I was so grateful for technology. I was able to talk to friends in other states and other countries who I couldn't visit. I was able to create a sense of community using uh, audio apps. I had a virtual tea room with people far and wide, many of whom I didn't know, some I did, and was able to create the sense of serendipity that one could have. Interesting story about how many people wanted me to, to commodify that space. <laughs> and I really just wanted to use it as a gathering space. And people are like, but you're so good. I said, so good at what? Talking to friends? Yeah, it could be a podcast. No, I don't want it to be a podcast. I just want to talk with friends and drink tea. And we're doing it virtually because we all have to be inside. Yeah, but you could start a... How do the technologies uh, enhance our relationships? Connecting with people far and wide is a great thing. Um, and then sometimes we can find ourselves over connecting to people virtually who are within walking distance of us. And there's other ways, you know, I, I, my question is what are, what's the nature of my relationships and my technologies versus my IRL, I can't stand that phrase, but our real life relationships, what's the difference? Am I grumpy in my real life relationships, but open and free on my online relationships? Am I curt and sarcastic in my virtual digital relationships, but shy and quiet when I'm engaging with people in the physical spaces? There are people who will say things to you online and they would never say it in your face. And then when you say, hey, say it to my face, they think you're being confrontational. What's the relationship between how we engage online versus how we engage in person? Uh, a friend of mine uh, coming out of the pandemic was saying how when she went back to the office, people would come into her office and speak to her and, and she would, you know, address their question, answer whatever they're asking. And then she would wonder, why are they still standing there? And then she said, oh my gosh, I'm so used to these text messages that I was sending during the pandemic that it didn't dawn on me that when I get out of that space, I would greet people. We might talk about the weather. We might talk about getting coffee. And then they would ask me for whatever it was they needed. And when they finished, I didn't just turn my back. They didn't vanish like they would if I was sending an email. They're still standing there. I see their emotion. I see that they want more connection. And I would speak. <laughs> And some of this sounds, it sounds a little funny to be saying these things, but we are now at a space where, while I'm talking about Sunra and the, alternate, the altered perceptions and relationships he had to space, I also have to acknowledge that all of us as a collective are also dealing with another variance of space to already integrate into whatever our own cultural relationships are to space and time. And this particular space isn't one where we exist alone. It's one where we are, we ultimately have to think about what, how we're benefiting, what we're gaining, what we're losing, and if we're losing something, how to recover. I just love Raj G. I suggest you listen to his music. <laughs> but in thinking about these things that we lose and we recover, also thinking about the fact that in these spaces, we are both the commodity, we are the product, we are being marketed, our data is becoming our identity. We can like this, we could not like it, but we must engage, understand, challenge it, 
or at least interrogate it for our own sense of self. So I encourage us all to acknowledge our relationships to space and time, to acknowledge our relationship to the earth, to acknowledge our relationship to one another. Afrofuturism values the, imagine the imagination. It values the African, African diasporic relationship to space and time, but it also values community. And as we think about who we are in this world, as we continue to commune, I suggest that we interrogate these relationships to space and time as they're articulated in the real world <laughs> and as they're articulated through our technologies. All of this is for our, our empowerment, for us to build, for us to grow, and for us to be the ancestors um, that those who come after us would appreciate. So thank you for listening. I, I wish you all of the best of weeks, and I encourage you to always imagine and, and value the intrinsic resilience that comes with the imagination. Thank you. <laughs>